good evening. Uh, you're, you're seeing a little bit more of me tonight because my good friend Rich Grease is running a little bit late. But I thought I'd come in and get everybody started and get everybody ready for uh, tonight's main attraction, which is this movie right here. We're in Bondathon. We're in our Bondathon. So James Bond will return. He has returned. These are the Bonds we're dealing with. Sean Connery, George Lazenby, um, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan, and, of course, Daniel Craig. Um, here's another really cool picture of them. Uh, my name is J.W. Caldwell. I am the host of the Generation Movie and Loud and Nerdy on the India Skate Network. And tonight we're looking at this movie here, The Spy You Love Me. It's the biggest, the best. It's Bond and beyond. Uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the 10th Bond movie, but Roger Moore's third. So we should get into that uh, in a little bit. We're just waiting on Rich. He had a bit of a computer issue, so we're we're waiting and... We hope to see him very soon. Um, if you tune in tonight and you're looking at it and you're like, you love our show and you want <clears throat> you want us to do well and you want to come back and tell your friends and we can have bigger and better things, um, by all means, check out the YouTube channel uh, on the India Skate Network. It has all our shows, so everything we've got going back for a while um and you know just like and subscribe it takes a little over three minutes to do that and it helps us out a great deal if you don't like youtube although i've, I've got more into youtube to be honest but if you don't like youtube uh, you can also find us on our facebook channel uh and that is the indie escape facebook page at facebook.com the indie escape the dot indie dot escape page a lot of good things going on there jerry kimura Putting up his, uh, it came from Jerry's basement titles. Really nice. A lot of cool things that we do on the network uh, with Generation Movie and with um, all of us. <clears throat> and let's see, we'll just say hi to everybody and then we'll see if Rich is ready. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Joe. Good evening, friends. Good evening, Ken. Great movie reviews on Friday, JW. Thank you. It was an interesting day. It was a, very interesting apocalyptic movies and a, a really heartfelt because that blockbuster feel was really there for Arcadian. I think Arcadian is going to become one of those movies that we talk about. What's up? Anyway, um, I'm taking back to my Bud Light days. Um, Rich Drees, how are you? Are you okay? Uh, well, I'm on my iPad right now. My uh, desktop is being a complete son of a bitch about life it's being, um, a, it's being a uh you know just a terrible yeah terrible I, uh computer i was out at spider-man uh seeing that on the big screen again <clears throat> phenomenal holds up really well and i think, um, I think the moment, original does hold up i what? think the second one holds up too oh yeah i'm excited for the second one next week i got home at like 20 <laughs> of and you know, kind of bubbled around. You had a Peter Parker, you had a Peter Parker like moment with the computer not working. Yeah, Amazing. so so I'm here. Oh, this this is, this is Jerry. The iPad. This Jerry's, is not my regular. I, I, no, I know, but Jerry's watching the show and writing as the India Escape Network right now. <laughs> the, in, the inmates officially run the asylum now. Oh, good uh, lord! Hello, bro hello, brothers. Hi, Hi Sean. Sean. <laughs> What's up, fellas? Um, we were talking about reviews on Friday. Um, I saw two movies this week, Rich, that I, I saw Civil War, which everybody's talking about and had a great weekend, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it's a pretty good movie. I think it, hel it holds up pretty well. Um, it's not what everybody thinks it is, is the best way to describe it. Uh, but <laughs> it, had, it had a big, well, cause I think everybody thinks there are going to be answers and there's no answers. It's, it's more. It's a road movie that is peppered with vignettes of what the world would look like if we do the unthinkable. Because, like, they, you know, Kirsten Dunst plays this war photographer, and she basically, midway through the movie, she says, I sent all those pictures home hoping that people wouldn't be fucking idiots. Like, I sent all these pictures home to warn them of what, what it's like to, you know, to have military on the street. Um, and I think it's more of a warning movie. It's a warning shot for people who are who are gung ho about it. Mm -hmm. 
I, and I, and I, you know what I mean? Like, it's like a thought, it's like a thought exercise. Okay. You want a civil war. Here's how it's going to break out. There's going to be military on the streets, right? All like the JC pennies you go to at the mall is going to be gone. Every, like everything is going to be changed, but that, if that's what you want, yeah, let's, yeah. Also the idea that, you know, we have people who are like, militia trained guys who are like going up against u.s military guys and it doesn't really matter who's shooting when you're being shot at true so <laughs> it's not gonna go well for people who've been trained their whole lives right mm -hmm. so they, the movie is really an interesting kind of thought thought you know i think it's a little bit less controversial than it's being made out because i think they want to make money and that's okay but it's more like a, a little, like a road movie with vignettes about what could happen if this, you know, it doesn't even explain like the, the, the big civil war thing. Like you can see it like on this little placard they gave out. Hold on, I don't think the, let me take the banner down. Mm -hmm. um, they gave it this little placard and you'll notice that California and Texas, the Western front are... They're the two. They're the they're the two states leading the charge against the government. So mm -hmm. it never really explains how those two go. Those two states got together. I mean, I I midway through the movie, I was thinking to myself, well, I mean, like economically, they're the two largest functioning ec economies in the United States. Maybe I don't I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really ask that. I, like, it's a really thought provoking movie, but it's not. It doesn't give you answers. Um, Kirsten Dunst is really good. Um, uh -huh. Kaylee Spenny, who is uh, in uh, Priscilla, it plays a young girl that kind of gets taken under her wing. Nick Offerman's in it briefly for you Parks and Rec fans. Um, but it's, it, it was, it's a good movie. I, it is not the movie I'm most excited about this weekend. Uh -huh. I, I saw mean, th this movie, Rich. Me. I saw this movie, Arcadian, Rich. And this movie, like, I have, I have ever told you, like, how I used to feel about Blockbuster when I used to work at Blockbuster on a, a Friday night? Mm hmm And somebody would come in and go, give me something good. And, you know, that first Friday when I was able to give Reservoir Dogs out to people, that's how I feel about this Arcadian movie. It's not going to cure cancer, and it's not going to change anything, but it's an amazingly well done movie by ben brewer who uh was the effects lead on everything everywhere all at once so you immediately know the effects are going to be good and then the creature yes. design the creature design is so astounding rich that i i just well I you had messaged me about that uh last weekend and i think on thursday yeah, if i had I, seen I, it or not and i was just like no here, dude yeah. i am yeah i just didn't have the time unfortunately because you know i had my I things i forgot you had on. your weekend i totally forgot you had your weekend and i was it was more out of excitement it was more like you know when you find a movie every once in a while and you're like i know this isn't what you normally would watch but this movie is really exceedingly well done it's subtle nick cage it's not crazy over the top nick cage mm -hmm. um and the creature design i just I've never seen anything like it. The other, the only other movie that I can, the two movies I compare it to, God damn it. and I'm giving it the highest praise I can give it. Uh, Alien, when those, when the Alien design first came out, stunning, right? Just changed the world, spun the world on its head. The other movie that I think about with creature design is a movie called Attack the Block. Yes, because the creature design is just something I, I had never seen before. What's great about the creature design in Attack the Block is. I mean, the whole movie is very a lo-fi lo science fiction film. Um, and they I can't see them having put a lot of money into that that creature and how it... But it's super effective on the screen. And it looks, the glow-in-the-dark the glow in the dark eyes and the glow-in-the-dark mouth and the glow-in-the-dark paws all work. And what I would say about this creature design... I don't know what the creature is, what the creature genus is. Like, we we're trying to come up with it after the movie. We we're trying, like, is it a bird? Is it a, is it, it burrows? <laughs> it burrows, but it also has a clacking, like, 
clack, clack, clack. And then it's, you know, then it does shit in the movie that's very insect-like. So uh-huh. it's it's got all of these things, all these components, and I just sat back and went, that's the coolest creature. And then there's a sequence, I'm not giving anything away, there's a sequence with a woman on the ground, and then the next time you see that woman, she's in a bathtub, and it's not great for her. Um, and then the creature kind of looks like a Muppet. It's weird. It, it just... And then they they do like they eventually do the things in like World War Z where they're all kind of like working in a unison, mm-hmm. and that's fucking terrifying because I couldn't figure out the creatures. So like I just I the last half hours like is just creature goodness. You know what I mean? Like the kind of movie yeah. that I I would go see with like my dad and be like, oh that creature is amazing. You know, like like a great sci fi movie. Mm-hmm. You had a big weekend though. What happened with your your this way to the egress, correct? Yes. Um Natasha and I had our latest short out premiering. This was kind of like our premiere weekend this past weekend at two different film festivals. Uh Saturday was at the uh Northeastern PA Film Festival. Uh been there, got the shirt, and um <laughs> Had a great time, great response. A lot of people came out. I appreciate everybody who made it out. And then on Sunday, uh, we were screening in the Allentown Film Festival in the um, in the middle of the afternoon in their surreal shorts block. Um, <coughs> and out of the eight films or so there, we were uh, voted best of the block. So we got a nice little uh, uh, oh, nice you mean little, this uh, thing here that says best surreal short. So. You mean this, Rich? Like this, so everybody can see it. <laughs> that wonderful professional photograph of the the plaque I took in um in my car. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I whatever it is, it looks fine. I think it it looks better big. Um, yeah. So the way this way to the egress, like I, I'm assuming it's going to get like some sort of premiere, like like Gilda did, and we'll all get to see it eventually, some point. Yeah, at some point, yeah, we're going to have it online. But honestly, it's probably not going to be for until like fall because we want it you know we have a number of other film festivals that we are out to right now we're kind of waiting on hearing back from them all um and we would love to have them i am as always with anything that goes on with you guys i am super thrilled for you guys um thanks because it's just because it's (laughs) cool and you know we share these monday nights where we're, we're talking about movies we love and you're out you know, producing movies that you want to make, which is, you know, is is absolutely perfect. Give a little bit of a, a taste um, of what this way to the agre- agre- uh, egress. I'm fucking it up for you. What <laughs> is, what is it? What is it about? It's um, it's about a uh, paperwork screw up in one of Hell's waiting rooms. So it it looks something like this. Yes. Um, and so it just, a, a paperwork screw up in one of hell's waiting rooms, mm-hmm. um, which is, it, you know, that sounds about right. I, yes. You know, I feel if we're going to have civil servants in hell. You're seeing uh, three fourths of our cast right there. Um, I'm sorry. I couldn't get everybody. Is... You didn't get all the pictures and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm super excited for you. Let's see what the comments are. Um, mm-hmm. Congrats on the award-winning film, Rich. What's up, Thank fellas? you so much, Joe. Thank you so much. Uh, I like seeing more of Rich's background. <laughs> yeah, it, it's fine. I'm cool. Um, Cage makes now, what now, 20 movies a year? You know what? Here's the thing, though. I understand that sentiment, but I would say in the last three years, and I don't know if Rich agrees with me, the quality of the Cage films has sprung up. Like, Pig was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Mandy's really good in a in a Cthulhu kind of uh, Lovecraftian kind of way. Um, he he makes, and like I said, it, Ken, what I would say is I split them into manic Nick Cage movies and subtle Nick Cage movies. This is a really cool kind of subtle apocalypse movie. He's a dad. He has two kids. They go through the daily chores to set up to survive through the night. And one of the kids is itchy. One of the kids is, you know, got a girl at another farm that won't take people in, which is fucking ridiculous. And then one brother is, you know, close to home with dad, but 
you know, has a like wants to learn about the monsters, wants to wants to build things, is an inventor. Um, but like I said, it's a creature feature with excellent creatures. Yes, uh, and Cage is really good. So he's subtle though. It's not it's not a manic Cage performance, and I like. I've always liked Nick Cage. I think he's a super actor. When he flexes those muscles and he's not full on face off, it's it's it, you know it's a whole different ball game. Uh-huh. Um, Pumpkinhead was a great design too. Yes, but that was Stan Winston. Stan Winston is way up here, and everybody else is kind of down here. Because Stan Winston created the monsters from our childhood, Jerry. Um, but you know that. I know you know that. Um, Cage makes almost as, mo- as many as Michael Pear. But again, Michael Pear, I don't know that Michael Pear gets the quality. I can. The one I would recommend if you really want to kind of see what Cage is capable of lately, Pig. Pig is a great movie. It's just about a, a recluse that has a, ba- a pig that he, that he spends all his time with and somebody steals the pig because the pig can hunt truffles. Like it's it, it's a mind blowing movie. It's but it's like it, it's very good. Um, he makes good movies. Um, but as we as we launch other things that ha- you know, Civil War did very well at the box office. We're also coming off a of CinemaCon that has apparently people excited. Uh, yep. You know, de- you know, uh, Wolverine and Deadpool, Deadpool and Wolverine, uh, Wicked, Gladiator Two, making some big, mm-hmm. big pronouncements. Um, so, um, so, um, so movies are back, uh, yep. and that's a, that's a good thing. Also, the next couple of weeks are going to be like, until we hit May, although we're not, we're not getting a Marvel movie in May. No, nope, uh, not till June. Hit, until, oh, not till July. July, excuse me. Oh, yeah. um, I've got, I think I've got everything fixed here. So you can, um, I have my uh, laptop in the okay, uh, waiting drop, room I'll there. I'll drop you out. Switch we'll bring me you right back up. Thanks. And you're back. Hey, hey, look at this. Uh, let me. I'm not sure. You know, Joe might be right. Maybe the, maybe the iPad's the way to go. Maybe we should both shift to iPads. Um, but <laughs> the movie we're going to talk tonight, it's Bondathon uh, 2024. And I was thinking about this today. I grew up on the Roger Moore Bonds, Rich, right? Roger Moore is kind of our wheelhouse Bond. We all both have of us, our issues. It? Well, I. <laughs> Well, you're a little bit, you're only a little bit older than me, so you grew up with Roger Moore too. Um Moore and Connery on the ABC Sunday night at the at the movies, you know, screenings tonight. <laughs> you know, with um, those great Ernie but, Anderson intros, you know, tonight, James Bond is back. You know, and uh <laughs> But this this is what we're doing tonight. We're doing the spy love me. I actually I I so a couple of things are happening when I'm rewatching the Connery of uh, the uh Moore Bond. I do not like all the jokes at all. They're terrible. Um, and there's one, like, we're going to get to it later. No, I'm going to get to it right now. But there's one. There's a sequence where she finds out, you know, we're going to talk about it. But there's a sequence. She finds out that he is the person that has killed her person that she was in love with. And the following scene, the scene, well, scene right after it, the very, it's a great scene. Barbara Box, great. She's a great Bond girl. She is, she's mm-hmm. sultry. She is uh, intelligent. She is, you know, she is all those things. And she is e- every much as equal. You know what I mean? And I'm super excited about that. But she tells him, after this mission, I'm going to kill you. Right? And then the next scene you see them in, they're being lowered onto a fucking U.S. submarine. And he has the goofiest <laughs> fucking grin on his face. And I'm thinking, like, she should cut the rope. She should cut the rope. Because it's just so out of place after this really tense emotional scene. And the problem is, it happens way too much. It, it takes the tension down. Uh, like, it lowers every bit of tension that he has. It kind of just... He allows it to seep out, and don't get me wrong. I I think the jokes are funny, but like that one, like he just has this goofy grin on his face, like we're tied together, ha ha. ha. After she just drops the bombshell, like I know that you killed my my boyfriend, and I'm gonna kill you after this mission. And it's the goofiest fucking grin I've ever seen, Rich. 
and it's. I like this movie. I like it a lot. It's I out of the more films, it's one of the better ones. But damn, there's some weird stuff that happens in here uh, that just drives me up a wall. The the run of women's drivers jokes when she is at the wheel of the van and they're trying to escape Jaws is absolutely cringe. It's just like these aren't funny jokes. Uh, you know, Bond looks well, like an asshole. Also, also he, looks he, like, looks, he looks like, he an, he looks like a in, douche. He doesn't care that they're in danger. I'm like, it, Jesus it, Christ. Well, Do not just something. in danger. Like, not just in danger. <laughs> Jaws is ripping the car apart. Mm-hmm. It's beyond danger. We've already seen in the movie, we've already established that Jaws bites people apart in the neck area. And he's just ripping the car. Like, they're hitting him with the car. It doesn't do anything. He's ripping like the doors off the hinges, like, and he's fucking around. Like, should I? Do you want me to drive? <laughs> it's like it, fuck yeah, he, not. It's just... Like, he, it's the first time I've I've ever looked at a Roger Moore Bond and just went, "He is so goddamn douchey." He's so do uh-huh. like in a non fun way, and like I said, I, the, I think... the biggest one for me was like. They have this amazing sequence where he's they're talking and it's it's very tense. And she's like, you were in Austria. You were in Austria like three weeks ago. And he's like, yeah. And then they they come across. They get to the point where he's like, look, I was I was skiing down a mountain. And I had people trying to kill me. And if it's you don't remember faces, I don't I I don't remember faces. It's a great line. It's It's a fantastic line. Right, it's a really great moment, and she, he's like, so I'm gonna, and then he like kind of just says, so I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna say yes, I killed your boyfriend, right? And she's like, fine, and when this mission's over, I'm gonna kill you, and that's all there is to it. And then the next scene, it immediately goes to him being lowered down, and he's a little bit lower than her, and he just has this shit-eating grin that completely saps any of the tension that was just happening. I know. Also, a thing in in Roger Moore Bonds, he doesn't do any of the Bond stuff at the end by himself. Every one of these movies with Roger Moore ends with him with National Guard or soldiers, like cannon fodder. Yeah, leading an army or leading. Well, 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 let's face it. The next one, he has the entire space race, like the Mm -hmm. entire, like a whole U.S. battalion. Well, Well, first of all. First of all, we have to acknowledge the fact that this movie is really just um, you only live twice underwater. <laughs> that's that's fair. It is. It is. It, you know, fair. it's oh, we're stealing, we're stealing somebody from the Russians, we're stealing somebody from the U.S., <laughs> and we're going to make them fight about it because reasons. And I, uh, um, well, I, and I have the problem with the, like I, we're going to get let's let's talk let's talk production because this movie okay, yeah. is a fucking mess, Rich. Well, they, is... they had like five different people working on scripts, and then they decided to pick the one that they liked the most. I read one of the ones that they didn't pick, and it's trash. So, well, so yeah, with... I mean, when what? you talk about when you talk about that, like, like the sheer, I I don't know how they got through any of it. Like, there's so much fighting going on in the Bond industry. Like, I you know, I, as I'm reading about this production about. We're firing directors. We're fighting over production. We're selling shares in the production. Uh, Eon, you know, has to make a movie with with United Artists every fifteen months, and there are rules. There are there are contracts that are messy, and then the scripts are so bad. And also, it's the first time Ian Fleming they take Ian Fleming's name off because he won't let them use one of the plots of the book. I don't under mm-hmm. like I don't understand like if you're in the bond business, right? I don't understand if you're Ian Fleming. I want all of these movies to sell like hotcakes. If I'm Ian Fleming's mm-hmm. estate, I want them to sell like hotcakes. I want the books to be very close to the movies, don't you? So yeah. it's a weird, no, it's a weird the, um, play. I read the Anthony Burgess draft, by the way. Oh, um, Burgess. Um, is, that the 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 hmm? is that the one with Smurf? Is that the one with Smurf? Like. That was the one with a a um, bad guy uh, organization called Chaos C H A O S, not K A O S. This was not, unfortunately, a Get Smart crossover movie. The nude bomb um, wasn't the nude bomb. 
Okay, no. so when you talk about the scripts, there's one with there's one script with Spectre, right? With Spectre still mm-hmm. in, in place. There's another one with Chaos in place. There's one with with Smirsh. There's one that also has a weird um what is it? Like it's an amalgam of all these different political factions that have decided mm-hmm. they're gonna they're gonna go after whatever. Um Yeah. And then and um John Landis wrote one. Where he Bond is stopping the Pope from being kidnapped in Latin America. In, in Latin America, yes. And I then you hear that one. so <laughs> so when and then like the, and that's just the beginning of the production problems. That's just the beginning because when they mm-hmm. write this script, they need the tanker, right? And they don't know how to shoot it. So at some point, you hear rumors. Well, a couple things. This could have been the first Steven Spielberg directed Bond film. What happened? They didn't think he was good enough for a Bond film, which is hilarious. That absolutely Especially hilarious. because Jaws was already out at this point when they were yes. starting to. Yes. I mean, he Jaws was just them, I want to direct a Bond film on this. Right. He so says they them, I want to direct a Bond film. And they say the, no. The story. They were probably more hearing the stories about him going way the fuck over budget on Jaws than anything else. Yeah, but this so movie that, went over budget too, Rich. They built it. Um, they built a containment tanker. Uh, for the tanker, that's one point five million dollars, which at the time is the most money spent on any on any set for any movie ever. Mm-hmm. Right? They built they they had a tanker. There's a tanker in the movie. There's a tanker, and the tanker swallows subs. Is what it does. It has three slub sots. It it basically eats sub like it eats a sub like it's a sandwich. Just opens its jaw <laughs> and just. The subs go in, they don't come out. And but they so they had to build a set there, they had to build a set for the tanker. There are rumors on this movie, Rich, that fucking Cooper showed up and said, Here, you don't know how to light this properly to be able to shoot it. And then probably the problem there, Rich, is they don't have a fucking director either. So Guy Hamilton, who directed the previous three, out because he mm-hmm was apparently offered Superman and then got fired from the Superman. Yes, this is like, there is so much going on in the background that you can't even like, this is, there's script problems. We don't have a director. We don't, we don't know who we want to direct. We can't, we can't wrap our minds around the containment budget uh, where Pine Street Studios, which is the home of Bond forever. They have to build three new sets, including one, that is never going to have another use again. And then you also have, like, there are so many wild stories. Like Three the, new what stages. Three new stages, yeah, you mean, right? It, yes, and it's just a fucking, mm-hmm. it's a crazy nightmare. My my favorite one is that, that and it's, it's a weird kind of aesthetic thing, but it's also, like, the weirdest thing. The villain, uh, the villain apparently lives in, like, the fucking, it's, it's the Legion of Doom. Uh, cave from the 70s uh, Justice League show he has and everything is on rounded edges and apparently one of the production designers the production designer came in and just said Ken Adam. Ken Adam and said I don't want any edges on anything so the guy's chairs don't have edges his computers don't have edges his fucking like his fucking tables don't have edges it's I mean I, Ken Adams Ken Adams has been a, the production designer on Bond all the way back all to Dr. Noyce. Yes. And this stuff is so iconic and wonderful, but it feels weird because this is like mid to late 70s at this point. And like in Every, the uh, opening segment where we see the um the the naval office where they find out it's like that really cool kind of like trapezoidal uh triangular but with rounded edges thing, and it goes back and back and back. It's like, oh, that's a beautiful set. But I don't buy it as a British <laughs> Royal Navy, uh, you know, uh, it's insane. It, it's yeah. So there's that. There's we can't get a direct. We can't figure out the director. We can't figure out the script. There are what mm-hmm. what seven different screenplays? Seven. Yeah. You know what Something I mean? Like, like and what, what was the? You got the Queen. You got the Queen Elizabeth uh, one. You got. They sound like jokes now. Like I, I, it just it sounds like a joke. <laughs> they have the Queen Elizabeth uh, kidnapping at uh, the bombing at the Sydney Opera House. They have the mm-hmm. the Burgess draft, which is apparently uh, complete trash. Um, they have a Spectre. Tra- uh, they have a treatment with Spectre. A, spe- a spe- uh, treatment with Smirsh. 
a treatment with what is it? The Red Brigades, the Beater Meinhof Gang, the Block September Organization, and the Japanese Red Army attacking Spectre, so that Bond has to defend Spectre and save Blofeld. Which, why the fuck would you? Why would Bond save Blofeld? And if there's then, a good reason to, that would be interesting. But because Japan... Oh, wait, no. Japanese Red Army was a um, terrorist organization, though, wasn't it? Yeah, they're all um, terrorist organizations. It was too close yeah. to home. I mean, the reason they didn't use the script was because they, they thought it was too real. Like, um, Yeah, this, this is the era where they kind of move away from any of uh, real politic in their any, thing, yeah. which is why you have... I'm going to kill everybody to repopulate the world. Supervillains here and then next in Moonraker as well. And it's not until For Your Eyes Only we kind of get back to something that feels well, a little bit more you speak grounded. You script as well. And then Tom Mankiewicz, yes, that Tom Mankiewicz, not the one that's not the one that's on Turner Classic Movies, but his dad. I, it, 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 I know, but that's what I mean. But it, but the Mankiewicz, everybody thinks, everybody yeah. thinks. Anyway. Thanks, son. You know, you know what I mean? I know his name's different. I'm just saying. Um, but Tom Mankiewicz comes in and polishes the script, but doesn't get a credit. So that causes churn yeah. also. And it's, it's just and it's ironic chaotic. Because he was also polishing the script for Superman for uh, Richard Donner. He, yeah, I mean, but yeah, he did he was, get a credit. Yeah, he was legendary. He, he is a legendary script polisher. But the thing is, he doesn't get the credit. And then, you know, they when they offer him other movies, to, like other Bond movies to fix, he's like, I'm good. You didn't give me a credit. You know what I mean? Like, so it's mm -hmm. it, like this movie causes chaos. And Rich, we're not even getting into like the shoot was was crazy. And the, the Pinewood stage, 1.8 million for one stage for one water tank that had 1.2 million gallons in it. And they uh -huh. couldn't figure out how to shoot it. So the Kubrick had to come and say, well, we can shoot it like this. You know, like. Uh, if you have Cooper coming in to explain to you about how things aren't working, that's not a good shoot, Rich. That like that's a that's a shoot that's got to be chaotic. If Cooper is the voice of reason, like I love Stanley Kubrick, but if he's the voice of reason, Rich, that's mm -hmm. a that's a that's a war, that's a boop boop boop. Like holy fuck. Um, yeah, and that then should be a sign. that should be a voice of reason, and then. You get into, let's not even talk about the production where Harry Saltzman like loses his fucking mind and all of his money, and basically keeps on threatening Eon and just fighting, fighting, fighting with the the broccolis, right, and with everyone, and just chaos, Rich, and like the idea that this movie made it out so well. It's probably the best Connery Bond. Or I mean, the best Roger Moore Bond. It's probably the best Roger Moore Bond. The idea that it made it out so well is is just a testament to the villains. It's a testament yeah. to um, the Bond girl. The, who's hired four days, four the days entire before history the movie started. Of the, Bond the entire history of the Bond franchise is littered with lawsuits. Uh, probably because there's a lot of money to be made here and a lot of money has been made here. And everybody wants some of that money. So it's, you know, it's crazy. I mean, we've talked before. I think last year when we did um, Bondapalooza, we talked about a little bit about um, the issues with uh, Kevin McClory and Thunderball. And well, the Saltzman yeah. thing is part of the Thunderball thing because Saltzman yeah. is the one that eventually makes Never Say Never Again. Right. Mm -hmm. So Saltzman is part of that group. It, it's, it's as fraught as the fighting over Friday the Thirteenth. Like, it's it's fighting for fighting's sake. It's crazy. It, it, the, mm -hmm. But the idea that they somehow this is an imminently watchable Bond. Like it's it's got good action sequences. It's got a batshit insane villain. It's got I I put this on my thing tonight because I'm gonna say it to you. Jaws rules. Like, I know it's not Moonraker, but this, I don't remember this. I remember Moonraker because I that was part of my functional growing up. I had Moonraker toys. I had little, like, theater cards that I had. I love Moonraker. I realize it's not a good movie. But <laughs> the Jaws in Moonraker is nowhere near as fucking cool as the Jaws in this movie. 
So, mm-hmm. it, you, like, I think it's a weird kind of like confluence of events that they get a script that kind of works. They get villains that are like the villains standoffish and creepy in a completely 2024 way. He's a billionaire who wants to kill everyone because he doesn't want to touch anybody because he's like, he's a germaphobe and he loves the ocean. He could literally be called Elon Musk and we're going to get more <laughs> to Musk later because it's mm. fucking crazy. Um, yeah. But, movie- but for all of this chaos though, the movie, like I said, I, I have problems with it, but I like it. It's one of my more favorite of the more group of the more bomb. Um, yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Like, it, but why does it like I was thinking about it, why does it work, Rich? It works because j- is there nothing cooler than Jaws every time he gets out of some sort of impediment? Like he crashes a car into a house, he gets out and he just kind of he's wearing a big blue suit and he just mm-hmm. j- he's great, but there- at the same time, part of my brain is going, This is a little too superhuman for a Bond movie, I think. You know, that he gets away with everything. I, 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 had, I, I agree, but I had so much fun with him. And also, <laughs> it was because it was so different from That's my, what I, like, he's so weak by comparison in Moonraker, right? He's, he gets beat up in Moonraker or whatever, but this one, he is, like, there's a sequence during one of the car chases where he grabs the fucking gun out of one of the other guy's hands and just starts shooting. And I'm like, this is a great henchman. He's better. He might be better than his than his handler. Like he like he might be like he should just really he should just go and kill the guy under the water. He should just kill him. I mean, mm-hmm. also Rich, Jaws kills a shark. And it's I'm not getting <laughs> I, I'm not ruining it for anybody, but Jaws kills a shark. He bites the shark in the back of the net and rips the fucking shark apart. And it was the single coolest thing for a villain I've ever seen. Um, which, it was just, which I, I feel I, has to be some kind of comment to Spielberg in some way. <laughs> we don't want our jaws, jaws. You know, our jaws, jaws can kill a shark. Um, okay, so the movie opens. Uh, it, it so I, you know, I was reading a little bit about well, filming, filming was tense, it was all over the world, really cool. I also mm-hmm. would be remiss before we get leave production to talk about. Um, a weird thing that happens in this movie. I'm going to go back to production for a second. Marvin Hamlish and Carly Simon are a weird pair. Song is great. It's amazing. It actually can transcend every, almost every other. It's a really good Bond song. It's fantastic, right? First movie that doesn't have the actual title in the title of the song, mm-hmm. which is what yeah. it's in the lyric. It's in the lyric. Secondly, Rich, how weird is it for Marvin Hamlish? who's in charge of the music on this movie, right? Because John Barry is busy, is what is what they say. is a weird-ass choice. Is a weird choice. But John Barry is busy because of tax reason. At which point, uh, there's all kinds of wacky musical choices in this movie. There is, there is Maurice Jarre is used twice in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um for the Dr. Zhivago theme for for Anya and also the Lawrence of Arabia theme when they come up over a fucking sand dune. And it's like, he gets away with it. Like, there's some classical music also used when Stromberg kills a bunch of people with sharks yeah, some mo- um, yeah, mo- and, and motorcycles. But it's it's a weird musical choice. It's mm-hmm. not John Barry. And while the Barry theme is, is still present, you know, John Barry not being able to... St- to theme this movie because of tax reasons. <laughs> Fucking weird, Rich, in the production. But again, Carly Simon, Marvel Hamlish, fantastic. It's a great song. It's a great song. I remember as a kid, we had the sheet music to that on the piano. And I learned, you know, I taught myself how to, I played a little piano as a kid, and I taught myself how to play uh, Nobody Does It Better. And it's, a, it's a great song. It's an earworm. I could play now unless you pop the music in front of me, and I'd still be pretty terrible at it, but I'd get through it. I mean, um, baby, you're the best. It, it doesn't get any, but you know. And then it goes to the spy who loved me lyrics. It's weird, uh-huh. but it's amazing. And like I said, the other weird jarring moment, like you know, if you're watching a Bond film, you do not expect to hear Lawrence of Arabia. You do not expect to hear Doctor Zhivago, for fuck's sake. And I just look at those as like. 
I I see your two weird moments, and I top you with one more weird moment that just I fucking hate. Go ahead. It's ten seconds right there at the end of the movie where we get the um oh uh, the male oh, version of nobody does it better for for like ten yeah, seconds, bad. and it's just like it's bad. It's a, it's, 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 it's just like ugh. It's bad. <laughs> and it's bad. I'm just like. It's then it, then it shifts right over to the Carly Simon version, which is great, and I'm happy for it. But that ten seconds is just like. Um, also, the, the, also like the weird things in production. Another weird thing before we go to box office. Another weird thing that they basically, um, I think they stole the thing from a whiskey ad. Was it a whiskey ad? The guy jumping off a fucking cliff and opening a yeah. parachute. Okay. Yeah. So, well, it was faked for the whiskey ad. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't yeah. was it real, real, real for the movie and costing yes. for the first time $500,000 for a stunt. It's no, I it wasn't I have 30,000. I have 30,000. 30, yeah. I thought it I was heard, 500,000. I, I they paid Rick Sylvester, the, uh, the stunt man who did this, uh, 30 grand. Okay. Um, I have it. Uh, the scene of bond skiing off the mountain was inspired by the Canadian club whiskey advertisement in playboy magazine. Rick Sylvester performed in the same stunt. The stunt cost $500,000. The most extensive single movie stunt at the time in history. Okay. Okay. Then, because I read that they paid him $30,000. So maybe the $500,000 is the whole total of the shoot. Yeah. Because it's crazy. They were there for several days waiting for the weather to clear so they can actually shoot it and have it look Do you realize it's, it's been voted the second most favorite Bond moment of all time? Really? Yes. The I huh. expect you to die, Mr. Bond from Goldfinger last week. Yeah. And the the fucking uh, thing opening up to the Bond theme with mm -hmm. the British flag. Mm -hmm. And apparently there was like at the premiere where they, they showed it to the Royals, even the Royals stood up and cheered. <laughs> well so, it was really really interesting is Rick Sylvester gets his name in the the top credits at the opening credits that you know they have like ski jump by rick sylvester yes it's which right is like, there they're they're giving credit to a stunt man for a for a piece of action in the opening credits and not burying it somewhere deep in the end credits that's pretty amazing because <laughs> well, i you think because I, I think it costs so much money that they had to justify it by giving the guy also it's a cool. He stunt. might have. He might have said, gonna, "I'll do it." I'm not going to lie to you, I, but I, yeah. we probably haven't had a stunt as cool. Like I was trying to think about, like I think the the last Mission Impossible movie, right? I mean, Cruz literally jumping off a cliff on a bike and flying down is close. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. but box office, Rich. This movie, so the man Made with bank. the golden gun didn't do great. Uh, which is a shock to me because, again, I thought every Bond movie did great. Um, production budget for this movie is insane for a Bond film. It's actually it's actually high for, for a Bond high film. For yeah, feels like that. Fourteen million dollar production budget, um, but opening weekend it grosses one point three million dollars. It plays thirty four weeks in nineteen seventy seven. 34 weeks um it opens at 194 theaters and never gets above 194 theaters so it it moves around the country it ends up grossing worldwide it grosses 46 million dollars domestic internationally it grosses 138 for a grand worldwide total of 185 185 million it's mm -hmm. 13 times its production budget yeah. and the inflation and, um... The inflated adjusted box office is 226. So if you're looking at it, kids, it it's Dune. Dune is in the 220s range. Yeah, but this was a film that was, if you um do the math and convert the production budget, this is a movie that was probably made for about 40 grand, uh 40 million. So yeah, yeah. So it's even it's even more shocking. Um, um but it's, and also, you have to remember, is this, is coming out, this came out in the U.S. in August of 77, when yeah. everybody was still piling in the theaters to see Star Wars for their fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth time. You know, because that had only opened up um, about it 10 may. weeks early. In yeah. May, and it was traveling around the country. 
So these mm-hmm. two movies, I envision a 77 if you were a kid and a little bit older, like I was only three, right? I imagine if you were a kid and you were about seven or eight, it was a good summer, man. You had Bond and you had Star Wars and it was glorious. Because, you know, the the numbers are astounding, but the other thing that we need to get into, and, and it's about time to talk about it, this is a pretty good Bond. Stromberg is a pretty good villain. I mean, he's a little like he's weird and standoffish, and he's easy to kill because he's an old man. Um, mm-hmm. But he has a good plan. It's it's a pretty good plan. We're gonna steal two subs. We're gonna we're gonna nuke New York, and we're gonna nuke Moscow, and we're just gonna wait under the water and create a giant civilization city underwater. Now they're gonna copy it immediately. They're gonna do that with Moonraker, which is hilarious. That they would. And I mean. <laughs> This this guy un- understands nothing about fallout because radioactive the water dirt is going to be irradiated. Gonna, yeah, it's, you know, it's not, is gonna he's not. The ocean. He's not a bright boy. Atmosphere. He, he's you not know, a bright he's boy. He's not very bright for yeah, as you say there. So, also, like, also, I just want to point out like there's nothing when you say it's Stromberg's marine biology facility. It again looks like a giant monstrosity coming out of the ocean it has legs it looks like the fucking legion of doom there's never a moment (laughs) where you're like this guy's a bad guy he's a billionaire and he's bad guy and i think that's an interesting thing like one thing that happens with the bond films as we progress right it -hmm. starts out cold worry right and then once you hit goldfinger we start getting into the villains that are super rich and crazy and insane and it progresses through a lot of the bonds all the way up like you know i don't want to say all the way through like the craig bonds but the craig bonds have a couple of fucking wonky people that have a lot of money too um they're not they're not they're not in great bonds with him but they're you know blowfield's a little bit off uh fucking that that one guy in quantum of solace that nobody cares about but he's like running an organization at an opera house like so like bond this is i think the the more bonds are where the bond films take the focus off real politics and just say look rich people are dangerous well that that can be a political statement in and of itself too i mean some people say especially on a day like today rich yep rich people can be dangerous bond is more of a conservative type of franchise in its political leanings and I can see that, in, you know, in certain ways, but man, any billionaire we get to come across in a Bond franchise is absolutely an evil bad guy who's trying to destroy the world for their own profit margin. Well, and not, that not is certainly margin. not a conservative it's value. And I appreciate not, this. Though, I'm going to be mind. honest with you. It's not just profit margin. It's kink. It's kitsch. It's kink. <laughs> it's it's a weird it, it sexual predilations and it, it's, there's stuff there. Like there's something weird about 65 year old billionaires that are only surrounded by, by young, gorgeous women. And there are a lot of them in this movie. I was, I, you know what I was thinking about our conversation last week with Goldfinger and how Goldfinger has a lot of controversy. I was watching this one, the fucking, the fucking like women driver stuff. Yeah. That's crazy. Anytime a new woman comes into the frame, she pushes her tits up and right into Bond's face, and everything's like Bond's like, I I got five minutes. I you know that is <laughs> Roger Moore's Bond. Roger Moore's Bond fucks a lot. Oh boy, does it way um, way before way before any kind of like weird uh weird you know sexual disease problems of the eighties. He is on fire. He is like bedding down some girl in Austria. He beds down the weird the weird girl at the one the hotel the hotel girls constantly hitting on him the one that tries to kill him later with the with the fucking helicopters hitting on him he gets to sleep with barbara bach and he shouldn't have i think she should have killed him um <laughs> but it's it, it that is one of the things that i'm coming to find i grew up watching roger moore bonds and the thing is um and it's and I, the two like the two bonds i grew up watching are more and I feel Brosnan. I got back into it, Brosnan, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Brosnan, at least Brosnan does the jokes, but they're always serious. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, See, I, 
I think one of my problems with the Roger Moore bond is um, not just even like the writings where like I, I made a note here as I was watching it today. Um, eight year old male. It's an eight year old where, male at the lunch table. Where he um where they're breaking out the 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 captured sub crews and Bond says to them, make for the armory. And you know, and and I'm like, how the fuck do anybody does anybody in this situation know where the bad guy's armory is? It makes no sense here. To go go and find someone everyone, and they're like, well, go, find, where? go find some weapons uh, and break yourself. It's you've I know you've been sitting for three months on cots. Mm -hmm. Not getting fed and stuff, but you guys break out. Also, lead lead the charge. Also, yeah, you yeah. go you go first. Um, go kill the guys in the red I, suit. I can shoot the bad guy in the balls. Yeah, <laughs> twice, twice. Uh, but like I said, like I think like it's a really weird thing for me. Like I I, it's a it's a grown up moment for me. Right? It's this bond mm -hmm. is not as good as it could be. Is the problem? And I still I, like it though. That's the oh, thing. it's a that's, good movie. Like that's, that's the thing. That's I can the sit thing. here and pick things apart left, right, and center. I'm still like, but I still kind of like it. The jokes are funny. It 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 has a good. It, again, it has a good villain. It has a good. The mm -hmm. plot is pretty. Like the the world domination plot. Like if we're doing it Bond, has, if we're doing Bond rules, right? Got to have a good girl. Bach is fantastic. She's. Oh, yeah. She's one of my favorite she, Bond girls after this. She's good with the material they give her, but I don't think they give her enough to really show she's like Bond's equal number from the Russians. Well, no, what do you and mean? No, what think, do you mean she's not Bond's X equal, Rich? She's called Triple her. X. Fuck. It's a terrible code name unless you're supposed to be like, Triple X, you know, like porn? <laughs> <laughs> oh, because she has boobies. Like, and that's yeah, well, yes. everything in, a, in the Roger Moore Bonds. It feels like a seventh grader. Like, you know what I mean? Like a seventh grader with chocolate milk coming out of his nose. The escape and pod at the end. Who in their right mind would design a facility with escape pods that just happen to have champagne chilling in a, in yeah, a bucket? I don't ask questions about that shit. Like, and then he's like, oh, I, you know, I don't, I don't like on that ice He's bucket. a great guy. Does somebody come in and change the ice in that ice bucket in all the escape pods every day? How do they keep that up? Oh, there's books here and there's will, plants. Will, what the fuck is I will this? Say what I came across, what I, I, I so did ridiculous. Discover. I love it though. I love Richard Keel so much in this movie. I mm. it was enough for me to get past so many problems. Rich. I had so many problems with more being such a douchebag that every time Richard Keel dusted off his jacket. I laugh <laughs> hysterically. And it happens like four times. It's a it is like an improv joke they go back to. I have the times. I feel that like it's kind of almost like a let's make Jaws kind of like have that same indestructible panache that Bond himself has. You know, kind of like as a mirror reflection. Um, you know, yeah, combining but, it, yeah. you know, grafting but it onto a guy who's seven feet tall with metal teeth though seems <laughs> Like a choice. Hideous. He's hideous and he's great and it's fantastic. And I enjoyed every moment he was in the movie. Every single thing. When he got dropped in the when okay. So there's <laughs> there's a moment where Bond uses a magnet on him. And I'm like thinking, well, there's two things. He actually the fights with him are really good. Like early Bond movies, the fights are not great. But the fights mm -hmm. with fucking Richard Keel. Throwing Roger Moore around in this movie is fantastic. There's a fight in the train where he just kind of like chucks him across the fucking room, and it's like, and it looks like it's real. It's close. And then they bond. He has to use his wiles, and he fucking shocks him with a broken lamp. And I'm like, <laughs> that's awesome. And then mm -hmm. you know, there's a weird fight. There's a weird fight in like Egypt. Where Bond, like, where you're watching it, and it's like, okay, that's Bond has to figure out a way to do it. He looks up, he sees all the stuff on like the like the rocks above him, and he just kind of like gets out of the the arm, the wingspan of Jaws, and it like, and Jaws of course hits the thing and it drops on him, and the Jaws hands comes out of the fucking thing. Rich, I enjoyed Jaws so much in this movie. It it was enough for me to to actually, it was enough for me to really really hate Moonraker. Because he's dangerous in this movie. 
He's yes. fucking yeah. dangerous. He Moon kills Raker people left and right. Character. Now, I just want to backtrack for a second. The stuff in Egypt at night at the, um, at the Luxor really with the, the lights coming on and off from the from really the show. Very reminiscent, on, reminiscent of Quantum, Quantum, Quantum of Solace. Reminiscent of Quantum of Solace and the idea of like everything happening at that opera house at night mm -hmm. with but, everything but going this is on around. Really well shot. It's well staged. You know where everybody is. The lights coming on and off First and people just you know moving when the shadows are on them and stuff like that. I think it's a great. It's a wonderfully conceived idea. It's a great it's really well done. It's really well done. And it's fantastic. Yeah. I, yeah. I enjoy I, that I scene immensely. Also, too far Jaws bites thing, Jaws yeah. bites a chain off a wall. And it's just it's fantastic. So, it was and licorice, he, but you know. I don't care. I don't care. You can't make me care about it. But like I said, um I, I think the other thing, like I said, it's got a good villain. I like the plot. I like the idea that we're gonna steal two subs and we're going to start nuclear war although it makes no fucking sense because the water's not going to work um but hey i like i think i there is one douchey bond movie the moment that i did enjoy there's a moment where he's playing some guy that's a marine biologist and he goes to meet stromberg and the lady the lady who's taken over is gorgeous dropped as gorgeous completely dubbed by the way the actress was did not have a good voice but her body was smoking hot so we dubbed mm -hmm. her but she tells Bond before he goes into the room, Mr. Stromberg doesn't like to shake hands. So if he could just avoid that. First thing Roger Moore does in douche in full douchebag fashion, puts out his hand. Hi, how you doing? And I'm like, that's that's cool. And like I said, there are many cool moments in the movie. Like we haven't even talked about the Lotus, the Lotus car chase. It's great. It's fantastic. It's well done. It's the sub shots, I will say this, the sub shots look fantastic. Like when the car changes into the sub and then they have a bunch of fights, like they have a bunch of fights on the road and then the, the car goes over the, like goes off a wharf and then it goes underwater and it goes after the, it goes after like the Legion of Doom place. And there's another bunch of fights with a bunch of people using scuba gear and using like submersibles. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. And everything looks pretty great. I had that toy as a kid. I had that car that turned into the submarine. And it's the, it was one of the my single favorite toys. And watching it today, I'm like, oh, this is cool. You know what I mean? And all the shots are great. Like, I don't know how they, they, to be honest, I'm sure it's just like a floaty device. Like, I'm sure it's just like a, a little bobber that they put under the water and did whatever. But they look good, and considering the movie was made in 77, which is, what, 47 years ago, it looks pretty good. Now, some things don't look right. Like, there's a cut sequence during the, the first opening. Uh, most, of the, most of the ski chase looks great. There's one scene where it's definitely Roger Moore in front of a green screen. But for the most part, the movie looks top-notch. It's got good action yeah. sequences. It's got a great Bond girl. Jaws we don't have any of that speed ramping that we saw in the um uh the Sean Connery era in the yeah. action. No, it 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 it's all action. The action works. They have uh they you know they do a couple things where I want to point out there's a a guy on the on the Italian village where he, they come out of the water and there's a guy drinking wine. He is the first unit director in Italy for all the Bond movies, and he appears three more times in the franchise. Mm -hmm. Uh, doing the exact same thing, just drinking wine on the Say beach. That. A big fucking <laughs> bottle of wine, too. It's not. It's like Mad Dog 2020 for Italians. Um, but the other thing is, it got good critical response, mainly because the critical response of Man with the Golden Gun, which we haven't done on Bonathon, was so bad. This was a return to form, is what the, the review said. Gen um, so we like Gene Siskel here. Uh, Gene Siskel, the, Sh the Chicago Sun Times, um, basically said, uh, "Spy Who Loved Me" is an extravagant silliness, a high cost undertaking. In let's pretend what which delivers a perfect formula. Actually, that's not him. Sorry, that's somebody else. Uh, Gene mm -hmm. Siskel loved it up until the point where he found Stromer to be less memorable than previous Bond villains, even noting that Jaws is far more entertaining than his master. Um, Janet Maslin, uh, it's a half hour too long thanks to the obligatory shoot 'em up conclusion. Nevertheless, the dullest sequence here 
um, but said uh, more was a share of self mockery. That's the thing. Like he, his performance up into a certain point was great. And I think part of it is because part of it is because it's so different from, from Connery and Ian and, and more like the books in a sense, but I don't think they get it truly like the books until Brosnan. I think Brosnan is the one that perfects the, I'm going to be humorous, but there's a lot of serious shit going down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and so, but the, the reviews were pretty great. Um, John Simon, one of the, one of, he wrote a lot of books about different kinds of movies. Um, there's a, this is the kind of film that can get away with everything and deserves to. The latest James Bond, Spy Who Loved Me, belongs in this class. And I think that's true. I think, you know, for the most part, it it's, you know, this is a winning Bond film because the component pieces are enough to overwhelm the more piece. Mm -hmm. Right? The more really bother me that I, I've never I have never been so bothered with a James with a Roger Moore performance as James Bond than I was today. I was so annoyed that he was making like I was so annoyed that he ruined Barbara Box really serious scene. I, it pissed me the fuck off. And I was just sitting there going, You've never hated him like this before. And it was like it's because he's douching and he's making jokes every three seconds. And every joke is about like about getting pussy and every, like, it's just weird. And it's, and it, it just goes over the top and it, it's, it's, it's the first time I've never enjoyed. I didn't enjoy it. And I, I mm. thought that was interesting. I was rooting for jaws. I was rooting for Barbara Bach to actually use the gun to kill him. Like, <laughs> like it's, you know, it's the first bond for me with Roger that I remember seeing. Like, Again, as we go through these, I don't watch these all the time, right? I watch the really good ones all the time. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And this mm -hmm. isn't one that I've I've watched a lot. And so rewatching it today, I was just like, he's getting on my nerves. <laughs> and I I it's the most honest thing I could say because it's because it's it it pains me to say it to you. But I know you all also think it, but I'm just telling you. For somebody that was a champion of more and grew up on more today was the first day where i watched the bond movie and just went wow there's a visible difference in how bad this is um legacy and franchise viability so uh they spend money uh, they make a movie every 14 15 months um th there is some legacy in the sense that some of the actors reprise their roles in multiple movies after this one. Um, I think, uh, what was it? The guy General playing Gogol. Right, Gogol comes back. He was actually in From Russia with Love and then, then jumps up. Um, yes. So, you know, also weird casting notice. I think it's Lois Childs. Is it Lois Childs that is, ends up going into Moonraker? Right, she becomes the Bond girl in the next movie. Yeah, even though she, she said she was not, she did not want to be a Bond girl, and so she ends up becoming the Bond girl in the next movie. I think because this one was so well received. Uh, but the next one, and also a weird kind of thing, uh, this is the only movie that actually uses a title. And James Bond will return, and here's where it gets fucking weird, kids. <laughs> it says James Bond will return. And for your eyes only, which is well, not not, not the movie that he will return in. He will return in Moonraker in seventy nine, and for your eyes only will not be made till nineteen eighty one. So but it's as we weird. Talk, well, and the whole reason is of because they switched. You know what title Star they were going to use next? That other movie that opened in May of seventy seven. Yeah, as we and and we've talked about how the Bond franchise has chased trends before. Um, yes. you know, and, specifically and, like live and let die, uh, um, chasing the black exploitation trend. Um, well, so, and, the, yeah. and the other, the other legacy is this is, this is another kind of a car movie, right? L the Lotus Esprit is the car of, of choice in Spy Love Me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this will of course become a franchise trend where Bond will only, only drive the absolute best fucking car going. Um, 
I, I, I do think this also is a legacy trend that actually for the franchise that gets away from it, this is one of the only Bond girls. I, I don't know. She's not as well. You're right. She's not super well written, but Barbara Bach is up to the challenge. She's, she's really good in this movie. And later on, during the rest of the Roger Moore Bonds, we're going to get Maude Adams. We're going to get, you know, Grace Jones, who's not bad, but is, the movie's terrible. We're going to get, like, it, it's just, this is the, one of the last times where Bond, where Moore's Bond will be viable. Right? Because Moonraker comes out, does well, but isn't a great movie. Um, For Your Eyes Only is probably the last Moore film where it's, it's 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 okay it's just an average bond movie right and then we get we get octopussy which is terrible we get a view to a kill which is terrible remember roger moore was 50 when this movie came out <laughs> and he keeps going for another uh almost 10 years in the franchise how about this Not to sound no, right, because i, I still can't get over the mad dog for italians comment the big bottle of wine joe it's a big cheap <laughs> bottle of wine. Um, but yeah, a, the yeah, Moore's fifty. He looks, and as we progress, he looks young here. Though this is one of the ones he looks young. He starts looking older in Moonraker. He looks, he looks what he's double the age in For Your Eyes Only, double the age of the Bond girl, which isn't great. Um, mm -hmm. Barbara Bach doesn't look double like double his age. You know what I mean? Like it, it starts getting away from him, and then we get a, a string of really bad Bond movies from Roger Moore. So it's, this is the last time he's completely Boy, revival, although I will, I will fight to this day that I enjoy Moonraker. I know it's not, mm -hmm. good, but I like, I, it. I think for your eyes only isn't too bad from what I remember. I haven't seen it in it, a long time. It feels I mean. like a much, much more grounded down to earth thing with the exception of um, him, uh, him and the bond girl relationship, which, you know, he is showing it's his age. Really it's really uncomfortable. Good. It's really uncomfortable yeah. in your eyes only. Um, and I think that's the reason we get Maude Adams in Octopussy. It's because mm -hmm. Maude Adams is a little bit older, and she, you know. But anyway, but I mean, still a sexy, this sexy is woman. A good, this is a good Bond movie. Um, it it feels like an interesting kind of trend that happens during these Bond movies. Third movie is where, unless you knock it out of the park early, right? Brosnan kind of knocked it out of the park, and his movies got su successively worse. But third movie is usually where you kind of find your your inner bond, right? Moore gets it mm -hmm. here. Um, he's already had two. He's had Live and Let Die, and he's had Man with the Golden Gun. Um, but the franchise keeps chugging along. This is the third more tenth Bond movie. We will get to twenty five kids, um, and it, it like so. It's not. It's a franchise that keeps on going. Now there isn't anything in this one where I um, had like the amazing True Lies Goldfinger moment, right? But there are a bunch of things. There is, you know, there. This movie has the car is playable in a lot of video Bond video games. You know what I mean? Like you can do the sub. You know, so I mean, it's and also Jaws. It, like, but Jaws isn't the Jaws that you play in the video games. The Jaws that is kind of like the franchise Jaws, is the Moonraker Jaws. And I don't understand it because this Jaws is so much more dangerous, Rich. It's so much more dangerous. <laughs> I, know. I, enjoyed him. I enjoyed him so much. I enjoyed the idea that he was just a, another henchman that happened to be seven foot tall with a metal mouth, which, by the way, I think is an actual Ian Fleming thing, although the character's not named Jaws, which mm -hmm. is weird. Uh, but, uh, you know. So, but that's basically the franchise viability. We're going to get, you know, we're going to eventually uh, more will age out. I mean, he's probably pushing age here, to, if I'm being fair. Um, and, you know, we get Moonraker, which is Ugh. just a weird fucking bond. Um, although, I, again, I kind of like it. Anyway, again, Jaws and a giant clown head is one of my favorite things ever. Also, Jaws killing a shark is rich. You'll never get me to say it's not super cool. But after we're yeah. done with all of this, we get to Timothy Dalton. Oh, yes. Only does and his second film is going to be our... Um... 
next week. Our uh, subject for next week. Yep. Yeah, it's right here. Oh, yep. yeah, hold on. We'll move that down. We'll get rid of that franchise viability. License to kill. <laughs> His bad side is a dangerous place to be. Coming in July, Timothy Dalton only got two bonds. Uh, so this is uh-huh. his second movie, but we're going to do it as his third. Uh, also coming up uh, in, the, in the next couple of weeks, so we have Timothy Dalton, License to Kill. We have The World is Not Enough with one of the worst Bond girls ever. So we go from Barbara Bach to, we go from Barbara Bach to Christmas, Christmas, what is it, Christmas Jones? Whatever yeah. far, it's so bad. It, Anya <laughs> on, on Nova to fucking Christmas Jones. And then, then things get fun, kids, because the best Daniel Craig Bond? Is it the best Daniel Craig Bond, or are we going to we can have fights about it. Um, we can fight. It's, it's, it's in the conversation. I mean, between this and Casino Royale, and I would say No Time to no Die. No Time to Die. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's that's a true statement. Uh, Craig had, of his five stints as the, as the, as, you know, Her Majesty's Secret agent, he had three out of five were pretty, pretty spectacular. Um, so, that's that may be bold well for the next bond who we of course hope will come in the next three weeks as we finish off bondathon 2024 because that will be the most exciting opening 10 minutes of any day we have um where can people find you richard rich tree i'm sorry richard he's rich Jesus. richard rich Dree. are you my mother or mad at me right now or what <laughs> i don't know your middle name what's your middle name I'm not telling you that. Because then that would be my your Myler Matt here. I had yeah, your middle that's... name. So like all it would have to be would nice. my thing would be John Wayne Caldwell. Like mm-hmm. if they used the full name, I was fucked. <laughs> fucked. All right. Well, you can find all of my writing at filmbuffonline.com. Um, we also have a Facebook page, which would always alert you when we have new stuff going up, as well as uh some late, you know breaking news, um, passing, uh, great history. actors and actresses, passing announcements, this date and history posts, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of fun stuff going on there. So check us out on Facebook or at the site itself. Um, I participate in two other podcasts. The first is the big picture podcast, which I do with my, um, co-host and best friend, Natasha Bogutsky. An um, occasional guest. She's an occasional yeah. guest. On She's an occasional guest here. We are kind of on a couple of weeks hiatus <laughs> just because she is in a um, a stage play this coming week. She's playing, uh, Lust. She's playing Lust, right? Yes. Lust. Okay. Yes. And uh, yeah, it's a play about the seven virtues, the seven vices, and the seven modern inconveniences. It's a huge cast. It sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm getting ready to see it on Saturday. I can't wait. Um, the other other podcast that I do is uh, as a member of the Philadelphia Film Critics Circle. It's called Film Scribes, and um, you can find that and um, at all your favorite podcatchers. Um, Big Picture Podcast you can find at bigpicturepod.com. And I am on Blue Sky and Twitter at Film Buff Rich. Okay, you can find Thanks, me. Bugs. Uh, quick bugs. Also, you have, you have a you have a award winning short. This way to the aggress. Oh, thank uh, you. Just wanna, yes. Just wanna throw that out there. Um, <clears throat> okay. So with me, got a couple things. Uh, first off, if you watch the show, if you like the show, Indie Escape Network. If you're creative, have a new indie movie trailer and or commercial, email it to us. We'll play it in an op- upcoming Indie Escape Network show. Uh, free. The dot indie dot escape at gmail dot com. By all means, send it to us. We like finding new people and we like putting people together you can also find me on this network tomorrow night tuesday for loud and nerdy uh where we go over uh fun news talk about movies um and talk about television and all kinds of stuff i'm sure we're going to discuss fallout x-men 97 this week as i catch up on those spectacular shows and also definitely going to talk about arcadian some more just because i'm I, I don't know if it's played up by you um but also you can find me J- the oh there we go jw movie guy on facebook jw movie guy on twitter jw movie guy on instagram threads jw movie guy on blue sky i am jw movie guy everywhere 
Um, and we will be back next week, Monday nights, for License to Kill, Timothy Dalton's last shot at playing James Bond 007. It's pretty cool. Mm. It's, it's, it's Bond versus, it's, it's a revenge-based Bond movie. Uh, kind of unique and interesting. Last comment of the night before we end up. Great episode. Good night. Good night, Joe. Thank you for joining us. We thank everybody Thanks, for Mark. joining us tonight. Stay out of trouble. Go watch a Bond movie. Enjoy your life. And we'll talk more soon. And we'll see everybody next week for License to Kill. Have a great night. Thank you.